All right, good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give it just another few moments for others to join in. We'll be right with you. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grant, and on behalf of the organizing committee and the panelists that I will introduce in a few minutes, I have the great privilege to welcome you all to this interactive webinar, where we will explore the interrelationships between natural capital and climate change. Today's webinar is the second webinar of our Road to Net Zero webinar series, and if you've missed our first webinar on financing the energy transition, you can catch the recording of that on our website at connect.arcadis.com forward slash COP26 dash webinar dash series. You can also catch it on our social media channels as well. Following this webinar, we'll have our next webinar on the 24th of November discussing how we can transition to electric fleets to reduce carbon emissions. And then our final webinar on the 10th of December, discussing the importance of social value as a key part to any sustainability strategy. If you have some time in your diary to attend, please do. You will not want to miss those sessions. Okay, now on to our topic for today. And well, over the course of the last 100 years or so, growth of our global society and extractions of the resources required to maintain growth has resulted in ecosystem destruction and biodiversity loss. This loss has clearly contributed to the climate crisis we're currently in, which is not only accelerating the loss of nature and biodiversity, but is also the result of the loss of nature and biodiversity. The objective that we all must have should not only be to protect our current ecosystem, our objective should be to increase global prosperity in a way that restores and enhances biodiversity and reverses nature loss, becoming nature positive. Now, the question for me that I'm gonna ask the panelists in the variety of questions is, how do we do this? Where should we focus? Yeah, and during the session, we'll explore our panelists' favorite reference material, sources of inspiration, but I also want to share one of mine, which is this year's Project Drawdown Research. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but if you haven't, do have a look. I like this research because it outlines solutions that are required to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and also ranks them in order of importance from a perspective of total avoided uh, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. And from a nature perspective, that research, research suggests uh, reducing food waste, having plant-rich diets, tropical rainforest restoration, uh, silvopasture, uh, and peatland protection are the top five nature-based solutions that we need to scale now globally. Uh, perhaps we can explore these topics with the panelists as well later. But clearly, uh, natural capital, nature, and biodiversity are all important topics. And I've noticed in recent years how quickly these topics are becoming more mainstream and now at the same level of discussion as carbon emissions reduction in this climate emergency conversation. So today, during our conversation, we will touch on issues and topics like uh, the desired outcomes of COP26 and the phase two of COP15, uh, agricultural advancement, current and pending regulations, the importance of broad stakeholder management as we develop nature-based solutions, measurement and science-based targets, building skill sets, so a whole host of topics. This is a content-rich session. Um, so before I bring in on our panelists, uh, and I promise I will stop talking soon, just some 
logistics and housekeeping. You may already be thinking, will the slides for this session be available? Well, that answer is no, because there are no slides. The format of this webinar is really in the style of a fireside chat. So you'll see us on the screen for the remainder of the hour. And yes, there are no slides. The best way to interact with us during this session is to type in your questions and reactions into the chat box, and I will do my best to pick up those questions and pose them to our panel in as real time as possible. Uh, and then lastly, enjoy the session. In this virtual audience, we have quite a diverse group joining today. We have representatives from the energy, uh, food, finance, transportation, government, property, consultancy, and industrial sectors here with us, confirming in my mind that natural capital and biodiversity is a focus area for everyone. To explore our main topic today, we have a great panel. And what I will do now is introduce each of the panelists quickly and then continue on with our first question. So first, allow me to introduce Dr. Bruce Lascelles, who's our UK Director for Sustainable Land Management at Arcadis. And Bruce is also the president of the British Society of Soil Sciences, or Soil Science, excuse me. And as a soil scientist, he undertakes soil surveys and land use assessments across a wide range of habitats. He specializes in habitat creation and restoration and in promoting land use change, which supports and enables a sustainable future. Next, we have Martina Gervan, who is a technical director at Arcadis. Um, <clears throat> she's a chartered ecologist with over 25 years of experience in biodiversity and ecosystems in the UK and overseas. She is the head of ecology and uh, arboricultural, arboro, arboriculture, ooh, tough one for me, as well as the global natural capital community of practice uh, at Arcadis and her experience. Uh, includes a PhD and postdoc looking at sustainability in soil ecosystems. I'm very pleased to also introduce uh, Shirley Robertson, the Head of Environment Consenting and Sustainability Strat Strategic Policy at the Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks. Over 20 years of experience in the utility industry, progressed through engineering into business delivery, sustainability and planning, and most recently fulfilling management, uh, a, a, sorry, a management consulting type role, uh, uh, helping the company go through a major transformation to be fit for future needs. She's closely aligned with regulation and government policy makers, working very close with Ofgem and other government bodies. And her primary role at present is to create an efficient business model that is innovative enough to drive real value for the end consumer, whilst at the same time still delivering business needs. needs. And finally, uh, Johan Lamarant, uh, who is a lead expert in natural capital uh, and biodiversity at Arcadis, uh, based in Belgium. Uh, his core experience areas are business and biodiversity, biodiversity natural capital accounting, ecosystem services, environmental impact assessment, green blue infrastructure as well. He is a co-author of the Natural Capital Protocol uh, and within the EU and business and biodiversity platform uh, since 2017, he's leading a methodolog methodological work stream related to the assessment of available and emerging corporate biodiversity measurement approaches. Wow, quite a wonderful panel and enough of me uh, talking. I'm going to ask the first question, and this is a question for each of the panel to answer individually. And it's very clear you all are doing great things in this space. And to really put your brief introduction in the context, I think it would be great if you could share with the audience what you're doing in this area at the moment. I think it'll give us some great insight and perspective and what's important to you. So perhaps if we can open it up to Bruce first, can you share what's happening in your neck of the woods? Yeah, <clears throat> Sorry, Jimmy. thanks Grant. Um, I mean, this is such a, a, a fundamental uh, topic 
you know, and there'll be lots of discussions and perhaps one of the things I hope to get that comes from COP is this, this absolute recognition of, of natural capital, of biodiversity, of the natural world, natural and physical world that we live in and we rely on. And, um, you know, lots of discussions focus around the sort of technology and innovation of how we can reduce embodied carbon, how we can store carbon. But the reality is that we live in a, and, and we rely on a world that has been changed by climate change and will go on being changed by climate change. And those changes are predominantly negative and predominantly uh, make it more difficult for us to achieve that, that sustainable future. And as a soil scientist, um, you know, clearly soils are, um, are where I, I focus, but one of the key aspects of the physical environment is the, is the interrelationships and interdependencies uh, across many aspects. Um, and we need to view the world as, as, a, as a system. We need that systems approach. Um, and one of the things I'm, I'm really trying to do, perhaps under that banner of sustainable land management, uh, but from the perspective of soils, is to highlight and to look at those, those interrelationships and to, to really try to drive much more holistic um, solutions to the problems. Because actually, if we've got a flood risk problem, the solution, a, a, a nature-based, if you want to use that phrase, solution, will drive so many other benefits as well, as well as hopefully dealing with the, with the flood risk problem. Great, thank you, Bruce. Martina, can I hand it over to you? Yes, thanks, Grant. <clears throat> thanks, Bruce. That's a really good introduction. It's a, a an incredibly exciting time at the minute. Um, I mean, I've been working in this field for over twenty five years, and one does see excitement come and go. Um, but we truly feel like now is our time to to really make make a difference. So we're supporting uh, governments and a really wide range of clients on looking at their portfolio operational and their, their land portfolio and helping them set targets for biodiversity and sustainability and deliver those targets. Um, as Bruce was talking about innovation, we're also working on um, measurements and monitoring for those um, targets around biodiversity and actually physically designing and implementing those nature-based solutions. Um, giving uh, confidence in those nature-based solutions by sharing our knowledge as well, monitoring the effects, the efficiencies of those nature-based solutions. And they can be within new development plans, whether it's a master plan for an enormous garden town, such as Octopal Park that we're working on, um, or it could be um, a much smaller a sub scheme, a sustainable drainage scheme for Thames Water. Um, that can also be new development or retrofitting. So green roof, um, green walls, etc. There's climate, climate adaptations and mitigations, but also as Bruce was talking about, we we're looking at the, all of the land that we have under our ownership and control. Managing that land better can make an enormous difference. And also, we've got to think about how we can support community groups for their aspirations. So we have a, a top-down approach, but we've also got a bottom-up approach where we're looking at local stakeholders, what they need, and how that can interface. Um, to really just deliver the best value for biodiversity business and people, because I think you know that 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 triumvirate is incredibly important, and it won't work unless we we get those together. So I'm I'm really fortunate enough to be actually sort of delivering these things, designing, delivering, and really excited about what change that we can actually uh, cause. Great, thanks for that uh, very much indeed, uh, Martina, and we'll explore why now is now uh, and targets and stakeholder engagement a little bit later. So you touched on some very key themes that will come back in this discussion. Um, Shirley, can I ask you to share a bit around what's happening in your world? What are you focused on? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Grant. So my biggest part of my job at the moment um, is, is making it real. Me bringing it to, to the tables of the directors and, and getting that discourse happening around about what biodiversity and natural capital actually means. Um, we are, as an asset engineering company, we are already experiencing the impact of climate change. So a lot of our infrastructure is, is suffering as a result of what's happening right now, flooding being the obvious one. But we're also seeing a lot of wildfires, which disrupts the, our, our, our security of supply for our electricity to our consumers. So. What's been really useful for me in the piece of work that we've been working on jointly with Arcadis on is bringing those things to life and why if we do something in these areas will prevent interruptions happening. 
and be able to explain that to our hard engineering colleagues and also to our directors and explaining the value to that. It's a very complex area. It's quite a new area for, for us to be um, getting involved in, but actually be able to unpick those pieces and seeing the, the, the incremental benefits that we can have across the network, but also very crucially making sure we'll have that holistic view and anything that we do do in that world does does have that bigger picture and, and, and how the benefits of what we can realise in that in that space. And then well, we have uh, a sorry, <laughs> we have have a job with Ofgem and our regulators to be able to convey that message. We can't do any of this without the right policy in place to enable us to deliver it. So that that's a key part of our job. So getting the the internal understanding and making it real for for our engineering business, but also the, the framework that sits around about that and making sure that that we are having those discussions as well. Well, the scope of that responsibility is quite large, uh, I'd say, and um, I look forward to hearing more about how you've been able to navigate uh, and prioritize what needs to happen and then also upskilling within your industry and company so that people know what we're talking about. Uh, but we'll we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Um, but Johan, can I can I wind up or wrap up this question with an understanding of what you're working on uh, in Belgium and surrounding Europe? Yeah, thank you, uh, Grant. Well, I'm I'm um, already in the in the field of natural capital and biodiversity for quite some years. And what we are seeing last year and uh, in particular this year is that there is really an exploding attention to biodiversity and natural capital, um, which is of course mainly due to the to the um, to the climate crisis, but also to the increasing acknowledgement that there is also a huge biodiversity crisis, and also the acknowledgement that climate and biodiversity are very much interlinked and that's really um, very very important also the business community and the financial community i must say are now increasingly paying attention to how to set targets in the field of biodiversity and also how to measure the biodiversity performance of their own activities of the activities of the clients so, and in fact, that's that's um, my main area of work at this moment. We are really supporting the European Commission um, with as part of the EU Green Deal. Um, and as you know, uh, European Commission has now very uh, ambitious um, projects um, uh, that are being established. And one of them is the Align project, where we aim to come up with an international standard for measuring biodiversity in a business context. And um, we are also linking up uh, with a new CSR directive. I can uh, tell something more about it later, but uh, the new CSR directive will replace the non-financial reporting directive. This also, also in terms of external disclosure obligations, um, it will become much, much more stricter and much more concrete for many, many companies. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Johan. Um, and we'll explore these new and emerging regulations and initiatives uh, a bit later. But first, I mean, even in my uh, very short intro, I use terms like nature positive, natural capital, biodiversity. Uh, Martina, I'm gonna hand this question uh, over to you first. What is the right term? How do we speak in the same language? What are we supposed to be saying? Or, 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 or how do we talk about this topic correctly? Can you? I think, that's, I think that is one of the issues we've had. Um, biodiversity is by its nature incredibly complex. I mean, that complexity is what gives us the resilience, the sustainability and the productivity that, that we need to live. But because of that complexity, we have struggled with messaging to people. Um, people, when questioned on what biodiversity meant, um, thought that it was something to do with a, a washing powder um, and it was uh, enzyme driven washing powder. And, and then back in um, sort of the, the early noughties, we had um, the ecosystem services. We had a fantastic Millennium Ecosystem Service project, which looked to, to describe and, and set the conditions for our ecosystem services. And then we moved on to the term of natural capital. And we also use blue infrastructure, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure, and nature positive. Now, I think one of our challenges and something that we really have to do is, is come up with something that is a little simpler. With climate change, we have carbon and measurement towards carbon. Biodiversity in itself is incredibly complex. So I think it's uh, a challenge for the industry 
there's not one right way of talking about it, but I think as an industry, we need to come together and, and think about how we are messaging. Now, sometimes messaging is different messaging is required for different people and different sectors, and that will always be the case. But for our sort of campaign for the future, I think we do need to think about simple messaging that everyone can understand. I don't have an answer for that at the moment, um, but I think it's something that together we really need to, to work on. Yeah, yeah, here, here. I was uh, just going to ask who's responsible for kind of developing that simple messaging and narrative, but uh, maybe this is an outcome of COP15 in the phase two uh, uh, in May. I don't know. But uh, as long as you're talking about this subject, I think that's uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, but yes, it does uh, get complex, but don't let that deter you. Um, so uh, maybe the next question, and I'm going to hand this over to Bruce. Um, everyone knows that COP26 is happening right now. Uh, the phase one of COP15 was completed virtually. Uh, earlier this year, I believe that was in October. Um, you've seen the agenda for, for this COP26 session, and in your mind, is biodiversity nature positive at the right level? Does it have the right seat at the table? Uh, is it where it needs to be um, um, uh, in this conversation in COP26? Uh, yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. And I think I I, I am a um, glass half full person and I want to be positive um, about this. And I, I think we should be positive uh, because we are talking about it. But perhaps to come back to the question, um, you know, is has it got the prominence? Has it had the prominence? I think the answer genuinely is no. I think biodiversity, natural capital have been talked about, but uh, the actions haven't been there. And I think maybe it comes back to what Martina was saying, that, that the simplicity of the climate change discussion uh, and the, the simplicity of 1.5 degrees temperature change is really easy. People remember that. The simplicity perhaps of um, that the Attenborough moment around plastics in our oceans, absolutely uh, easy to understand, easy to get that message across and really struck at home. And we haven't found that point with, um, with biodiversity yet. But there's a really poignant quote from uh, uh, one of the one of the historical um, heads of um, the soil survey at the USDA in, in America, and about the soil life nexus, nexus. There's no life without soil, and there's no soil without life. And absolutely, but you could swap biodiversity for uh, swap, swap soil for biodiversity or natural capital. We are absolutely reliant on the natural world, and um, and and we've got it wrong in how we've managed the natural world, how we've exploited those resources historically. And we can't simply solve the climate change problem by you know, reducing our carbon use, storing carbon. We've got to solve the, the current and ongoing problems that climate change and, and all our other activities that have affected land, habitats, et cetera, uh, we have to solve those as well. And so we really need to see biodiversity and natural capital, whatever term we use, shunted right up the agenda to sit alongside the innovation and the technology that will will drive some of the other uh, solutions to, to climate change um, you know globally a third of our land is degraded um, you know that the, the scale of malnutrition and, and food insecurity is is so so immense uh, we, we've really got to start working at this now yeah yeah and there's a very clear connection between uh, nature and biodiversity and climate change as well. Yeah, would anyone else like to expand or give their perspective on the connection that nature has with climate change? Yeah, Johan, go ahead. You're on mute, Johan. Yeah, excuse me. I think that's a really important point because um, many companies have done and are still doing a lot of efforts in the field of climate and they are taking action to reduce uh, carbon emissions and and that's fantastic but they fail to make the connection to biodiversity and we see that there are many synergies between actions uh, taken by businesses in the field of climate mitigation 
uh, when businesses are investing, for instance, in carbon offsetting by um, reforestation or uh, similar types of projects, wherever in the world, they are also doing well, or they can do well in terms of biodiversity. On condition, of course, that the investment is not in monoculture of um, forests, um, because then they create a very low biodiversity value. So, but by combining a biodiversity perspective with a climate perspective, you can achieve a win win situation. There is also in the field of climate adaptation, uh, there are many, many benefits uh, to be achieved um, because more and more companies are increasingly becoming vulnerable for climate change for instance flood uh, floodings uh, um, undesired floodings uh, storms and, and etc but these are very often related to degraded ecosystems for instance the, in, in in many countries around the world the mangrove forests are degraded the coral reefs are getting degraded and so on or rivers don't have sufficient space to flood. So everything is uh, is coming together at, at, at very local points where also industries are facing problems. So also by investing in climate change adaptation, businesses can, can, can have a lot of benefits. And climate change adaptation is very often investing in nature restoration, biodiversity restoration. Well, it's not it's not only business that uh, is struggling with this or has to make bold commitments. It's also governments at the you know country city level. That's the it's the policy level. And um, I was reflecting on a quote from uh, Elizabeth Maruma Marema, who's the executive secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and she hopes that the messages from COP twenty six on the importance of protecting and restoring nature to reduce emissions um, will lead to um, ambitious or an ambitious biodiversity accord next year when the biodiversity COP concludes in May. Yeah, and I'm wondering, well, is this possible? Uh, I mean, do, do, do you feel that the wider importance of biodiversity that has been overlooked uh, and surely I'm very uh, interested to get your perspective on what your thoughts are on what needs to change in order to make this happen from a policy perspective. Yeah, I think really good, good questions and insights from the panel there. I think from my perspective and, and from my business perspective, like I have these debates all the time. So um, why should it be us? Why, why should an energy company be paying for this? And I have to win that argument and, and win that communication challenge. I think the COP15 and, and COP26, I think these are all, the, all obviously all brilliant because they get the, the discourse going. But it's what happens beyond that. What are companies and, 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 and state actors doing? How is the policy then going to be driven down? We had the Paris Agreement, and 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 now we have this this this, this further further COP twenty six as a result of that. We, we were looking for to make make commitments. We have COP fifteen now. Are we going to be waiting another five years until until governments are, are held to account to make targets against this the, this space? So I, I know in Scotland what we are looking at, our, our Scottish government are looking at what's coming out of COP fifteen, and then going to be building on a biodiversity framework policy as a result of that. I know there's the environment bill, and I know that the UK government are looking at this biodiversity net gain of ten percent. But it still makes me feel a bit like is that enough? Is that enough to to actually conquer what? what we need to do here. Biodiversity net gain, of course, whatever we are doing, we shouldn't be be having a negative impact on what we're doing. But what about everything we've done in the past? And, and how do we get up to a, a position now where where we have restored that? So that's what I'm looking, looking forward to. What are the governments and the decision makers going to be doing as a result of the outputs of these conferences? And are we going to see real change coming through in policies to allow businesses to make the decisions? And, and that's not a cop out. When I always get asked, why us? Why should it be you? I, I always ask back, well, why, what if it's not us then? Who is it? Who is the person that's going to be doing that? We all have a responsibility here. And, and as some of the other panellists have said, we rely on that as humans. So we need yeah. to do something. And, and, and it needs to be now. We need to stop waiting for proof that there's an impact. We know that the impact is there and we need to start doing it. 
Wow, well said. And um, there's certainly a responsibility, but also an opportunity uh, here as well. And let's 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 talk about uh, biodiversity net gain and uh, and um, you know can we achieve this realistically along with population growth, uh, the need for resources that are required to make that happen and. Uh, kind of, I, I'd like uh, if you, you to respond to this in a slightly different way. And Bruce, I'm going to start with you. And I'm curious around an agricultural production perspective, a food security perspective, and biodiversity gain. How does all of that come together? You're on mute, Bruce. Sorry. Apologies. Uh, yeah, absolutely interesting, but hugely complex uh, problem. As, as I mentioned earlier, um, a third of our land globally is degraded. We've got um, you know three point two billion people affected by by land and soil degradation. We've got you know, huge numbers of people who who live in a world where food food is not secure for them, where there's malnutrition, and we've got to solve that. But actually, when you when you start to look at this globally. Problems are not about producing more from more. It's about producing enough from less. And I, I think you, Grant, you mentioned um, food wastage. The, the figures are phenomenal. Somewhere around 30 to 50% of food is wasted uh, globally on an annual basis. And, and that's phenomenal given, given the, 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 the crisis that many people face day to day. Um, and so, so we've got to try to work this out and find out what the balance is. But the reality is, uh, we can't keep on going as we are. We can't have business as usual and hope that we can mitigate and adapt in the corner of a field or in a, uh, a distant, uh, distant geography. We've got to start working, understanding the systems and building and layering the benefits and the solutions together. And agriculture is a, is a, is a really good example of where we know that's possible. Um, there is, you know, if you take things like agroforestry, you can start to to build in better, you know, increased carbon sequestration in that landscape, but still be able to produce food, uh, still to have a you know a vibrant agricultural um, uh, business and enterprise in, in in those locations. And there are lots of again, we're coming back to terminology: agro, agroforestry, agroecology is perhaps a broader term where we where uh, the aspiration is to bring ecology and food production back together again. Not not on the field margins or the field corners, but holistically integrated um, as well. Um, and I think and, and I think that's all possible. And actually that by doing so, and this has come back to those inter interrelationships between climate change and, and biodiversity, we start to recarbonize our landscapes, recarbonize our soils, re recarbonize our, our habitats. Uh, and we start to both be able to adapt to climate change, but also help through biodiversity and natural capital solve some of the, the climate change problems. But the reality with, with agriculture and food production and a growing uh, world population is that uh, we've also got to then bring innovation into this as well. And um, I, I saw recently some statistics on the sort of, the, the sort of number of mega cities that uh, are, we will have by the end of this century, I, I don't know, something like 68 or something mega cities. And we therefore got to find innovative ways to produce food within an urban environment. And that's going to require us to look at aquaculture, um, you know, growing foods in a soil less environment, but things like vertical farming, um, but also taking that back, not, not thinking we've got to do everything at scale, but taking it back to a community level. And I know a couple of people mentioned about the community engagement, um, but producing food at a community le level, having green space at a community level, and that will both help with food security, but also drive engagement and an understanding of the, that sort of absolute critical importance of the, of the natural world. So, it, you know, it, it comes back to those holistic system based solutions. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned it's going to take innovation in order for us to get there. And uh, I was just having a chat uh, a couple of days ago with a new startup company that makes proteins out of air really fascinating stuff that's happening in this space. Um, but but Bruce, maybe just a quick follow up. What's the biggest blocker from making all this happen? Is it a lack of education? Is it lack of policy? Is it financing? What's what's preventing us from just doing it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think 
to some extent, uh, we are we are at a state or in a, in a state in our world where that the problems of, of food insecurity have driven civil unrest, have driven uh, migration of people, um, and actually trying to reverse that um, and, and deal with the land. We've also got to deal with some of the social um, uh, aspects that have been have been a cause of that. But I think fundamentally also it's about recognition, it's about understanding, but it's also about finance um, and investment. And I think we've got to recognise that uh, th those people, those communities who manage the land and produce food need to be paid a fair price for both the produce, but also the, the co-benefits that come with that, uh, if I have come back to that phrase, eco-agriculture eco for, for water retention, for carbon sequestration. Um, and I think there are some there are some numbers being 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 sort of talked about at the moment in terms of the price uh, for in, in carbon trading terms that we should be paying for carbon. And it, it's got to be more than is, is currently being paid or currently being predicted to be paid um, in the next year or two. Mm. William Bruce, thank you very, very much. Um, Martina, I'm coming over to you now. And again, to truly drive biodiversity in that game, we need policy. Um, and I'm hoping you can talk to us a bit around the policies, uh, regulations that are now in the UK driving biodiversity net gain. And then uh, maybe over to Johan, if you can follow up with that with the EU perspective, I think that would be very interesting indeed. Sure, thanks Grant. I mean, we've always had fantastic policy in the UK. I think we've got some of the best policy writers in the world. <laughs> Um, the, the problem is with implementation of that policy. Um, the Environment Bill is bringing around 10% uh, net gain, and as Shirley said, for new development, um, that's great. Is it ambitious enough? Um, and then it, it doesn't cover all of the operational land use, and it doesn't also cover land management. Um, but it's a fantastic start. And what we've, we've noticed with even that 10%, which is a simple thing to understand, We've seen a huge upsurge in um, in that requirement. So we have a metric now, which we didn't have before, which is fantastic. We have a target, which we didn't have before, and I think it's it's the, the job now of 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 us to make sure we're we're delivering the best outcome um, to to those targets, but also pushing for more. So nature has is in healthy ecosystems do amazing things for us. You know, they 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 really. They do do all those jobs and they, they also support people's health and well-being enormously. So I think it's our job in, in design when we're working in the planning environment, when we're working with clients um, to say, well, what more can we do? How far can we, can we push this? So we do have wonderful policies that were, are not always um, enacted. Local planning authorities don't always have the resources. Um, so many planning authorities don't have an ecologist. So when we're looking at the, the applications for, for, for buildings, for, for, for cities, for towns, for um, commercial use, we're not always having the people there that will have the, the lens uh, on, the, on the world that we will have. So I think that means that uh, while you know, we're all responsible, you know, like Shirley was saying, it's a case of our clients leaning in, our governments leaning in, our profession, everyone in the profession leaning in and supporting so where a local planning authority doesn't have that that you know um, insight doesn't have an ecologist, that we are highlighting for them as much as possible um, their policy requirements where we're we're complying with them and we're really driving it. So while we do have great legislation and policy, um, I think it's down to all of us to to drive it forward. Yeah, really nice. Uh, definitely opportunity up and down the value chain, indeed. Um, Johan, what's the EU perspective uh, in how regulations can, let's say, change behavior and make uh, biodiversity net gain just habit? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, there is at this moment, there is not um, a clear a European ambition in terms of net gain. Huh? Uh, the European Commission, they had a biodiversity strategy over the past years, and they are now revising it and will come up with more ambitious targets. But in that strategy, they had a, one of the objective, objectives was to restore at least 15% of degraded ecosystems. 
Now um, we will all look to the next uh, COP15 in, in, in China, what the global um, ambitions in terms of biodiversity will be, but for sure they will, they will need to be much more ambitious. And what's also interesting now is that also the business community, I'm, I'm talking very much, very much about the business community because I think it's really very relevant. They are now also mobilizing themselves uh, to really get ambitious biodiversity targets also at the global level, because it's really important for them to create a level playing field and to have the stimuli yeah, from a legislative point of view, policy point of view, to make to support them in setting uh, ambitious biodiversity targets. And what we see now is that there is um, globally one, one common and increasingly accepted a tendency for going to nature positive uh, nature positive the, the 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 drawback at this moment is that there is not a clear definition yet of what it means but um overall one could say that uh, the idea is to achieve a nature positive situation by 2030 and then to to go further for restoring all ecosystems by 2050 so now we are in the phase of bending the curve. We are now still in a situation of biodiversity being lost. Also, companies have a huge responsibility, but we see an increasing number of businesses setting targets like we want to be nature positive by 2030, or we want to be net gain by 2030 or zero impact in terms of biodiversity by 2025 or 2030. The challenge for them is how to measure that, how to make how to make that true, how to underpin it with objective quantified uh, metrics and so on. And this is where we can help and where we are supporting our clients by quantifying the real biodiversity performance. And in terms of other legislative initiatives from the European Commission, I mentioned already the CSR directive, which will be extremely important. It will, um, it will become operational already in 2023. It is, of course, for um, EU-based companies, but uh, it's, it's, it's very obvious that it will have a global impact. It's really setting the pace in terms of external disclosure on uh, natural capital performance, and biodiversity is one element of, of it, but it will be quite ambitious, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's for now. Uh, so uh, maybe a follow-up question for you, Johan. Um, Science-based targets for nature, uh, the uh, task force for nature related financial disclosures. These are emerging um, frameworks and what feel like they play in this discussion, either standardizing language or the way that we measure or, and as you say, the way that we disclose and report. Yeah. Yeah. What we see at this moment and this, uh, this, um, coincides, of course, with the increased interest in biodiversity is that there are many initiatives going on. The Science-Based Targets Network for Nature is one of the most, the best known initiatives, and their key feature is, uh, let's say, about setting targets. And so they will come up with an approach on how you can set a biodiversity target, which is scientifically robust at the company level. We'll still have to wait uh, until the end of, of next year to see what it really means, but it's uh, really it's uh, based on very solid work that they are uh, doing at this moment. But target setting in terms of biodiversity is their feature. The TNFD that you mentioned is more about what are the business risks for companies related to ecosystem degradation and how can you measure them? So it's also a part of the puzzle and how are you disclosing information? So it's really about external disclosure, how you should report upon that. The project we are involved in, Align, and the name says itself, tries to get all these initiatives across in the same direction eh? in order to avoid further divergence because this is absolutely the last that we want to have, diverging in terms of terminologies in terms of uh, appointments in terms of external disclosure so everything should come together very nicely but every initiative has its piece is, is let's say a piece in the puzzle at this moment and within a line we try to to bring them all together yeah great 
Yeah, uh, I'm glad we have people like you on the case, huh? This is a quite, uh, quite a challenge for us all. It's um, quite strategic indeed, yeah. Yes, yes. Surely you've been very patient and um, I want to uh, direct this next question to you again around truly promoting biodiversity and net gain. But for you, because you mentioned earlier, your challenge with stakeholder engagement. And if you can expand on that specifically from the importance of public engagement perspective, um, you know, how SSE is perceived by your customers and what you're doing to build better engagement so that net gain is common. Yeah, thanks Grant. Yeah, so we really value the voices of our, our consumers um, and the framework that we operate in, the regulated framework we operate in, it, operate in means that anything that we put forward has to be evidence-based and stakeholder-led. So it really gives us a vehicle to make sure that we can do really effective stakeholder engagement and that that will actually be baked through into our final plans and how we run our business. So that's how we sort of start our stakeholder engagement piece out and, and trying to demonstrate to our consumers and people who we're engaging with that it's not just a tick box exercise. We will be trying to bake their wants and needs into, into, our, into our plans. Throughout the journey, and I've been involved in this piece of engagement since 2019, and what that there's been a big shift against the sort of awareness of environmental issues as a whole. So we engage across the whole sustainability sphere um, or, or, or certainly that's the part that I'm responsible for and where you would see a lot of our engagement sessions that we have are now the most the best attended ones so the appetite for engaging on topics like this is is increasing and has done rapidly over the past five years so that's really positive in terms of that people want to come to come to these events and they want to have their voices heard we do have a mix um, we are a massive infrastructure company um, so we do builds a lot of things about a lot of ugly engineering infrastructure now an engineer at heart myself but we do try to be considerate of the environment so we do have to be very careful in what we are doing so there's a lot of consultation goes on when we are doing project consultation and that starts right the way back at an environmental impact assessment and, and builds up from there before before a spade goes into the ground and we really try to bring our, our, our communities on board with us um, which can be really difficult uh, particularly in areas where there are the, there are issues where we have Third peatlands already, and, and we are building further infrastructure on top of that. So we have to manage that really quite carefully. In terms of the support for what we're trying to do um, wider, that's been quite respected that we are trying to take this further. And actually, what we're seeing is our communities are really pushing us hard on doing things differently. So when you actually get down and in, into a community level, the projects that we've done over the past have been the most successful when the communities have supported them and been involved in the delivery of them as well. And that's really a real lesson to, to show that stakeholder engagement shouldn't just be that tick, tick box exercise in order to get real success from projects like this. And particularly these ones, um, the communities need to support them and be, be involved. And we're seeing that across the board when we look at other similar type companies who are following like similar challenges. It's the ones that are community driven that, that have the most success. Yeah, I'm glad you're seeing this as well, because I see this also that communities want. Yes, that's great, but being a part of the delivery, uh, I think that's that's great. What a, that's, a, that's just a, a great story and. I don't want to go too far off topic with this uh, with this follow up, but you mentioned the sustainability sphere, and I'm just curious, uh, uh, Shirley, like what are those additional topics that are at the forefront of the 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 minds of community members that you engage with besides biodiversity? Besides biodiversity, I think the key one is the just transition and making sure that we have this transition. Throughout not not just the energy transition, but the whole net zero transition, and um, that is really critical to them. Um, in Scotland, in particular, whereby we're we're, we're moving away and we're, we're in a really strong position in terms of renewable energy production, but there is still remnants of, of, of people or workforce who who are concerned about that transition and what that means. From a distribution perspective, what we are seeing from our consumers is that the low carbon technology transition could potentially leave them behind. Um, 
might not be able to get the full um, benefits of a low carbon technology system from a distribution network perspective. And that's the transition that we are seeing, where a lot of the activity in the network will happen at that lower voltage level, whereby um, our consumers will be able to trade um, potentially between each other. But if you don't, like for example, my parents would never be able to engage at that level, and therefore they wouldn't get the benefits out of the network and not be able to get the best advantages uh, out of the low carbon transition. And, and we see that a lot across our consumers, particularly where we have high high levels of fuel poverty. So we are doing a lot of work. We we we, we partnered up with the Centre for Sustainability Energy to understand the, the, what we need to be thinking about when we are doing design of projects to make sure we are not. We're not making vulnerable people more vulnerable or putting people into more vulnerable situations. And that's that's a key part of our, our, our understanding. The other part is that we were hearing that a lot of our consumers didn't really understand what the term net zero meant. They heard a lot of politicians talking about it, but didn't really understand. So we've done a lot of work with them in that space of what it means for us and what how delivering a credible net zero is really important to us as a business. And helping them understand that and biodiversity natural capital based and being being a huge part of that of course science based targets has its place and that's absolutely what we're trying to achieve in reducing our carbon emissions but we also believe that the the natural capital piece is the other part of that equation and that's really helped us explain that to to consumers and help them understand what what we mean by that credible net zero journey yeah wow fantastic um and uh you mentioned the challenge around upskilling uh, consumers, um, ourselves, uh, uh, up and down the value chain. And Martina, if I can uh, hand this over to you, I'm, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, what are the best resources that people can go to to build up their knowledge? What are, you, what are your thoughts around what's required to upskill us all? Uh, just what's on your mind when it comes to education and engagement? Thank you. I mean, I think first and foremost is even an upskilling in the industry and the practitioners, as well as with with clients and with the public in general. Um, we have been maybe very focused on quite narrow sort of regulations before around maybe individual species. So there is an upskilling around ecosystem services um, in in sort of the profession in general and. Um, in, in the kind of strategic response that we need to make, as well as the design and the implementation of, of nature-based solutions. And the other thing that our industry, um, because we were servicing a sort of a different set of requirements, these have wonderfully come quite quickly. So with the, the net zero and with our 10% net gain and with some of the commitments we've made for 2030, we're seeing a lot of demand on environmental specialists across the, across the board, but we haven't got enough people. The other thing we suffer from in our industry is that it is a very narrow demographic in our industry. Um, it's in terms of um, uh, sort of race being I mean, largely Caucasian, um, usually from a relatively um, wealthy socioeconomic background as well. And one of the challenges I think we have is to uh, outreach and and, and provide a much wider uh, breadth of community with the uh, ability to become involved in ecology. You know, natural history used to be a, a very middle class kind of um, amateur um, exercise. And as professionals, we need to make sure we're getting the, the very best minds involved. And that means reaching out at school level, because some people don't know what an ecologist is, for example. And, um, that you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't a profession. It, it's actually very over a very short um, period of time that this profession has developed. Um, and then going out to people, we have internships, for example. People can come along and do either a job experience at, um, at, at companies like ourselves. And our professional body, Saeem, is also doing a lot to promote diversity and inclusion within our, our workforce. So there's a lot to do, really, in bringing in different people and um, upskilling our profession as well as our clients um, and, and the people in general. But I think as you know, we've all sort of touched upon, the best way to do that is top down and bottom up. And we're working with um, groups like Ambitious About Autism and um, Grow to Know, who are actually working in communities, looking at land, um, how they can actually get communities together to get the benefits of ecotherapy, 
the benefits of working with um, with their hands, with the land, with the soil, with biodiversity, and really um, having making sure that one those benefits are available to all of, of health and well-being, but also there is um, an educational um, and you know opportunity really for people that maybe wouldn't normally be involved. Well, uh, Johan, did you want to build on that? Yeah, very short. Um, yeah. Let's hope that within a few years we will have as many natural capital accountants as we have financial accountants these days, and then we'll finally achieve in a good position to save the world. Wow, yes, well said. Um, and isn't that a nice uh, call to action um, from Martina as well? You know, if you have the ability to uh, engage with a young person, uh, internship, uh, part of the STEM program, just building that awareness uh, early on in their lives, careers, please go ahead and do so. I think that's a, um, a very lovely sentiment indeed. Um, and Johan completely agree uh, as I uh, even look within our own company, uh, that balance isn't quite there ourselves. Uh, we're certainly heading in the right direction, but uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we also have some work to do. Um, uh, we have about five minutes to go and um maybe if 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 we can just close out um you know i've heard some amazing things but uh you all the audience didn't come here to listen to me and what i would like to do is just go around the virtual room and if each one of our participants can share um their reflections their reactions uh what from this conversation really resonated with you um, what do you really want people to remember as they walk away from this webinar? That would just be fantastic as a way to close out this session. So, Bruce, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, what did you get from this very, very rich discussion? Um, yeah, I, I maybe in one word, hope. <clears throat> and as I said, I'm uh, glass half half full. And just to hear new stories, new new discussions around the things that are, are being done. And I think that's what we mustn't lose sight of. There is a lot being done. Um, we just need to increase its prominence um, and and get the message out there. And and you know, really, really um, love what you said earlier about the sort of the local community and community engagement. Absolutely, if we can engage with the communities both to increase their understanding, but also learn from them. Very often, and, and as a soil scientist, I work with farmers and landowners and management managers a lot, and they absolutely know their land. They know exactly where the wet spot is, where something won't grow, where it's stony. Uh, and we need to tap into that and be very, very genuine and honest in our collaborative approaches and not just think it's it's a, a top down off the shelf solution that we as experts can can design and deliver. It's, it's got to be working with those communities. So I think, yeah, in a word, hope, um, but you know, um, uh, coming back to, to, to your comment, Grant, that actually just that from COP, and from COP26 and leading into COP15 conclusion next year, that absolutely that recognition of the importance of the of the natural world um, in all its forms and all its complexity to to our sustainable future um, needs mm. to be right up there. Mm. Very well said, Bruce. Thank you very much. Panel, who would like to follow? Maybe Johan. Yeah, take it away. Um, yeah, maybe. If there is one message that I would like to convey with the participants is that um, we heard a few times that biodiversity is um, quite a challenging topic, but um, don't wait um, until the perfect, I would say, in terms of uh, measuring biodiversity, setting targets, taking action. You can do already a lot today um, because it's really urgent and there are many no regret actions that you can start taking. In. And what I definitely would like to advise is start with measuring your baseline what's the what's your biodiversity footprint today because you will need it to demonstrate progress over time that's my short uh, message what mm. great thanks johan um shirley can i ask you to share your reflections yeah so i, I i've enjoyed listening to, to all the speakers learning lots as well um but my, my call out would be just get involved um, read, there's lots of uh, articles, even easy 
five minute article reads that are coming out all the time, which is lovely to see. But we can do something and we can start we, we can start now and it's don't wait till somebody tells you it's the right thing to do. We kind of know that already. So so, so just get involved and, and do something. Well, great. Get after it. I'm yeah. With that. <laughs> I would, I would follow that up. Yeah, with saying, you know, each individual person as well can make a huge difference. Um, you know, changing our food, you know, purchasing habits, um, changing what we eat. Um, we haven't, you know, talked on, on that a huge amount, but our, as an individual, we might feel very powerless. But actually, when market calls for a change, the market can change overnight. We can see the pandemic has taught us that. How fast have we been able to turn around? So I think there is real hope and opportunity and all of us can turn things around really quickly because we, we do sometimes hear, you know, a lot of the, the, the horrific, you know, outcome that, that, that could be if we don't act. But I think what we have to say is actually we know how quickly we can change the opportunity. So that's kind of the message I would take away from it. And your one change does make a difference. Um, it makes a difference within your community. It makes a difference within your professional circle. It really makes a difference. So whether it's not concreting over your garden, if you've got one, planting some plants that, you know, that are really wildlife friendly, changing your eating habits, um, in, you know, thinking about how you could donate even to some of your wild spaces that you're really enjoying. More and more of us are getting out and enjoying them. And we're not paying for them as much as it takes to to actually maintain them. So, so many things we can do. And I think my my takeaway is one of hope because we've got fabulous people working on it. We've got we have got um, guidelines, policies, uh, targets. Maybe not enough yet, but as Johan says, we you know just deliver what we can, deliver more, do what we can. Yeah. Well, absolutely brilliant closing thoughts by each of you. Uh, I thank you very very much. Uh, for your time uh, driving this conversation. Uh, to the audience listening, I really hope that um, you got as many uh, uh, benefits and takeaways from this session as I have. Thank you indeed for joining as well. Do tune in for our next webinar, uh, the end of November on the 24th around our transition to electric fleets and using that to reduce CO2 emissions. Again, I thank everyone for joining today. And um, yeah, biodiversity, keep that at top of mind. I'm gonna be doing some, uh, some research and finding some five minutes uh, articles to read myself. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Have everyone. a good afternoon. It is, bye.